Brown, would you lead us in pledge, please? Yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Victor, would you lead us in your prayer, please? God, we thank you for this wonderful day you've given us today. God, we thank you for all the volunteers, God, that have helped the city of Monta Vista as of yesterday and throughout today, God. That's that you will give them peace and comfort, Lord, and uh, and provide for them, Lord, the things that they need. God, we ask that you will uh, guide our paths tonight in this council meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You need a roll call? Councillor Locke? What? Uh, here. No, I'm saying what to her. I am here. Councillor Lorenz? Obviously. Here. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Hi. Here. Mayor Becker? Here. Uh, Councillor Foster is in Africa and is dismissed this evening, and a quorum is declared. Oh, we match. <clears throat> Any modifications to the agenda, if you need us? Uh, yes, sir. There is a modification to the agenda. If we could please add J1 Resolution 2022-05, declaring a uh, declaring a disaster. I would move to uh, add Resolution J1 2022-05, declaring a disaster. <laughs> Somebody second. I feel like second. Here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a push. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Just moving along. Gotcha. Been <laughs> moved and seconded <clears throat> to modify the agenda to add J1 <clears throat> resolution 20 2022-5 resolution declaring a disaster. <clears throat> Is there any more discussion? Nita. Councilor Locke. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Segola. Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to add J1 Resolution 2022-5, declaring a disaster. Okay, approval of consent agenda, minutes of regular meeting for April 7th, 2022, minutes of special meeting for April 14th, 2022, and review and approval of accounts payable. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Is there any more discussion? You need a? Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Segola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the consent agenda. All right. Citizen comments, special presentations. <clears throat> Citizen comments. City welcomes your unscheduled comments. Please limit the comments to three minutes. Council will not take action at this same meeting. Kathy? Good evening. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kathy Lorenz. I live on North Henderson in Monte Vista. Um, so just wanted some thoughts. I know you don't make decisions at meetings based on input, but I don't know if everyone has seen the forecast for the next two days from the National Weather Service. Uh, there's a two day critical extreme weather risk that's only been seen in the state of Colorado once since 2010. Uh, all the other counties around us have enacted fire bans, and I am asking you tonight if the city of Monta Vista would consider doing that, uh, because right now with the, the fire danger the way it is, the low humidity, the high winds, they say there's gonna be high damaging winds this weekend. I was wondering for the continued safety, for their safety of the community, if you would consider that this evening, I would appreciate it. And just wanted to say, Chief's gone, but uh, yesterday at work kind of had a bird's eye view of what went on and just wanted to thank our police officers that literally we watched putting themselves in harm's way 
to get people out of their houses and um, move people. And the response from the fire departments all across the valley is truly greatly appreciated by the community. And that's all I have to say. I've got the map of all the other counties that have enacted fire bans. Only Alamos and Rio Grande have not in the valley. I believe that it has to be the sheriff that activates that, correct? For county. Well, that's what I understood today when I asked uh, Chief Dingfelter, and and Nita is saying otherwise. So I, I'm going to have to. I do I reached research. out to the county commissioners and got no response back. Well, it's not the county commissioners; it's oh, the sheriff. Oh, the sheriff. Okay. So sheriff. council did okay. pass an ordinance back in 2018. Um, ordinance 86886, an ordinance of the city of Monta Vista, Colorado, amending Article 7, um, offenses against public peace of the municipal code of the city of Monta Vista, um, Colorado, by adding section 87110, emergency fire ban, setting forth details in relation thereto and declaring. An emergency, therefore, the City of Monta Vista Council believes that from time to time it may be necessary and advisable to allow the Chief of Police or the Mayor to declare an emergency fire ban on open fires and other any other types of fireworks within the city. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> so, yes. as it was in citizen comments, are we allowed to do anything there? We're going to have to. I think we can. We can make our own decisions. I think we can act on it tonight. It wouldn't make much sense to put it off for yeah. a month. No. Right. So <laughs> if, if it's pretty much it's up to me that we could just declare it. So so be declared there's a fire ban in Monta Vista. And so what does that mean? There's no fireplace <clears throat> fires? No open fires is what that says. Okay. So no fire pits, no burning ditches, no... No fireworks. There's, there's usually, and I, I don't know if this is where, but, but there's usually different stages. Like there's a stage one fire ban, stage two fire ban. It depends on what you're in as to what you can do. Well, based so, on whichever one's the most strict, um, that's based on the weather forecast that I've seen because of what we're trying to get done. It would only make sense to do that. Dale, do you want to put a time limit on it? Yeah. I don't know. If it makes any sense? But I think. How long? And I know it's going to be critical for the next probably week anyway, and maybe longer. But I'd say probably two weeks at least. Mm -hmm. Let's just do it till the next next council. board meeting. It'll maybe. be a month, and it'll be May, and we can reevaluate then. Yes, I would agree to that. Okay. So declared to work. So and so no um, charcoal fires. Just so everyone understands what. What it means. What about like, like barbecue? Usually, if it right. has a, a source Charcoal, that you can shut off. Mm -hmm. When I lived in Sawatch County, we had fire bans all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the it was if it had a source like a like a gas backyard gas grill, it had a source you could turn off immediately. That was still allowed unless it was actually a stage one, and even then, even that wasn't. So it, it just depends on how, how far you want to take it. Maybe, um, I would say gas grills are fine, but charcoal grills, because you run the risk of them being blown over the high winds that we're supposed to get. So so no campfires, no... Uh, media. So our ordinance uh, spells out that fires, for the purpose of the section, open fire shall be defined as any outdoor fire, including but not limited to campfires, warming fires, bonfires, fireworks, and not already prohibited by municipal code smoking or prescribed burning of fence rows, fields with lands, trash, or debris. That covered it pretty well. Yeah. Yep. So, oh, well, and that lays out what your powers are, so that's where it's at. Yep. So it's declared. Or don't even need that. You just declared, right? Yeah, you just declared it. Do it. So, so it's done. So maybe the Rio Grande County will follow suit. 
Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Dad. Don't need any more yesterdays. Just saying. Any other citizen comments? Okay. Uh, scheduled appearances. Discussion on F A M L I. Family. Yeah. So, council, you have a you have a little packet. Um, my, I thought our HR director was going to be presenting this, so I'm going to read part of what you've already got in hand. But back in November of 2020, the Colorado voters approved Proposition 118 on the ballot, and that um, has created a state ran paid family leave medical insurance program and the program does not go in effect until 2023 however we've got to start thinking about this and it it will allow an option for municipalities to opt out of this if we want to and you couldn't vote on that today it would have to actually be posted and then voted on at a later date but you've got to just consider what this could potentially mean to our budgets, uh, how it impacts employees' compensation, and any human resource issues. Uh, fam family, I think they just pronounce it family, provides workers with 12 weeks of paid leave to take care of themselves or a family member during the life of an event like injuries, serious illness, or pregnancy. Participating employer and employees will contribute to the premiums of family. Employers start collecting and remitting premiums starting January 1st of 2023, and the benefits will be available starting 2024. So the premiums are calculated under new administrative rules. Uh, participating municipalities must collect 50% of the premiums and the employee contributes the remainder. If a municipality does not participate, the employee is responsible for 50% of the premium and the municipality can, but need not, deduct the employee portion from payroll and remit that to the state. So an employee, so if we opt out, an employee can still pay for it themselves if they wanna participate. A municipality that miscalculates premiums is responsible for the difference and cannot collect that amount then from the employee. All municipalities are included in family by default, but a municipality may opt out and avoid the employee portion of the premiums by a vote of our governing body. The municipality must give prior notice of the vote in the same matter it notices, manner it notices other public business must provide special notices to the employees and must take testimony before the voting occurs. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention for you to read through. Um, if I'm taking a guess that uh, I know Council Member Sagala is gonna attend CML, if any of the rest of you are gonna attend consider attending CML, it'll probably be a point of discussion. So far we have heard of two municipalities that are going to go ahead and opt in, but everybody else overwhelmingly is looking at opting out. So this is just putting it on our radar. We're going to have to address this later this year and see how we're going to handle it. Do they have, so they talk about the fees being calculate by this prescribed methodology. Any idea what those fees are and what the benefits are? Great. No. And that's why they're collecting fees for a year yeah. prior before it's enacted so that they already have their pool of money, hopefully. Yeah. And yeah. Great to know, not know what the cost is before you <laughs> pop it in there out. Yeah. Well, Sometimes how government works. <laughs> Thank you, Gigi. However, not today with the rate increases. You're going to know what the plan is. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, 
we will go out of session and have a public hearing on the wastewater rate increase. Mike? All right. We'll uh, call the public hearing uh, to order and uh, I think it makes sense to start with Rob. Uh, he seems to have a pretty good idea of what's going on and then we'll allow for other folks to come in and make comment if they so desire. Rob, Rob, if you just state your name for the record and who you are, and then proceed. Yes, sir. I'm Robert Vance. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Monta Vista. This is the second public meeting that we've held in regards to the rate increase. Tonight, I have um, via Zoom, who's really small, but um, Nicholas Marcotte, who's our engineer, as employed by the city, is here as well to have answer any questions anybody might have. Um, I guess the first question, just to make sure council's in agreement um, with light of the current or what happened yesterday, is this a discussion that council still wants to have tonight so we can move forward? I believe so. Yeah. Me All right. So um, on the first meeting, and I brought notes from that. Um, there were several questions that were asked, and I will kind of address those in order that they were received. Um, pull it up again. All right, so first question was, um, have there been fines assessed? And the answer to that question is yes. The CDPHE, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, has assessed the city $80,000 in fines for violations of the metal requirements on our, our wastewater permit. Um, city is working currently to do a SEP program. Um, we are going to try to keep that $80,000 in the community. So we have proposed, um, GG actually proposed some things um, that so far CDPHE isn't happy with and that will keep it in the valley in the city of Monta Vista and the money will go towards improvements at one of our um, elderly care facilities. So we will actually take care of some needs that are happening at some of our facilities there. So, so that's where we are with the SEP. Um, Real quick question to the audience. Everybody understands that we are looking in order to meet the metals requirements, we are going to have to build some sort of a mechanical plant to deal with those metals and limits. Our lagoon system simply cannot meet the metal requirements. Um, has everything been decided? And if so, why meet? Nothing has been decided other than the need through CDPHE for an actual mechanical plant. Um, we are currently out of compliance. Um, it is highly recommended by staff and by Nick that we do proceed to do something to get ourselves back into compliance. Um, if we don't, those fines will be reinitiated and they will continually get larger until we do come into compliance. Um, the cost of remediation will also re increase as we wait. So the citizens, the residents of Monta Vista will eventually pay more. Um, have we looked at other options? Yes, to some degree we have. What we don't want to do is to look for a cheap Band-Aid type fix. There are some temporary solutions that might, and I stress the word might, get us into compliance, but we cannot guarantee for any length. Um, in the first meeting, I explained that we are currently operating under an administrative extension of our permit. We do not know exactly what our current or our new permit requirements are. Nick, maybe I can get you in here at this point um, to kind of give just briefly what you think we might have and 
just your professional opinion on some of the temporary things such as you know some different technologies that are out there so and, rob hang on just a second we're having yeah. some technical oh. difficulties he can't hear us okay all right so i i, I can i just am now able to hear I'm there sorry we go. To hear, but... so nick if you can hear us um <laughs> could you explain we were talking about some of the temporary band-aids that we've looked at some of the technologies um, that we've discussed. And while they're, they're good technologies for us long-term, um, we just don't think that they're really gonna give us a long-term corrective action. Sure, yeah, thanks Rob. I can speak to that a little bit uh, uh, here. Um, so uh, there are a couple of, uh, well, there are several uh, effluent limits of concern um, for the short and long term. Uh, short term, right now we have the metals limits that we have on hold, the veterans and Henderson wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, and then longer term, we have um, uh, nutrient limits. Nutrient limits include total nitrogen, total inorganic nitrogen, and total phosphorus that will, uh, we expect to continue to uh, uh, be you know over time continue to be more stringent. Um, so there there are some kind of banded solutions, if you will, um, that could uh, meet uh, the sh how short term limits. Um, but the, and based on the size of the the, the the Henderson treatment plant, the veteran treatment plant um, would still be very costly to implement, uh, and would still require uh, funding. Uh, you know, outside funding, federal, state, or, and or federal funding to implement um, and would, would require a 30 to 40 year loan, but would not uh, would not serve the city, uh, very likely would not serve the city for that 30 to 40 year period that that loan is taken out. Uh, so our approach on this, the, te the team approach on this from city staff to element engineering has been, let's, let's not focus on a band-aid that gets us across you know, the next five to 10 years with a 20, 30, 40 year loan. Let's focus, focus on an approach uh, that, can, um, that can allow compliance um, for the long term. Uh, so we, there, you know, so that there are, there, it's a better strategy um, and will, while more expensive upfront, uh, will be less expensive in the long term and not lead to future violations, not lead to future penalties. Uh, so that's been our approach. Thank you. Um, next question was, when would construction start and how soon will all this take place? The construction of a new plant will not take place for probably most likely another three to four years before we actually get into physical construction. However, um, part of the requirements from USDA and some of our, our funding lenders would be that we would have monies established to start making those debt payments when they do come due. Um, and we do need to make sure that we do that. So this is a very long process. We have to go through design. Uh, we have to get CDPHE's approval for design. We then have to go through the bidding process, get that all done. Um, any permitting that Nick needs to do as far as the environmental and the other things from the State Department that he has to get done before we can actually get a physical contractor on board to even move one scoop of dirt. So, so we have a long process ahead of us and as Nick can test, we, usually that process through USDA is a three to four year process. Okay. There were several questions in regards to the rates. Um, I will try to answer as many of those as I could here. Um, we need a rate increase in order to pay the debt service that will be incurred. Um, we have to do that now. The result of not doing it now is when we do need to do it, that rate increase is going to be considerably larger. Um, the one we're proposing is still very large, but the one to ultimately get us where we need to be um, could be extremely 
higher than what residents are paying now. Um, we believe that one large increase is much harder for residents to budget for and it does not provide the backbone that we need as far as funding to start making our, our payments. Um, there was a question as far as would rates go down and no. Rates would probably never go down and then most likely to be completely um, transparent. Mm -hmm. There will probably be continued increases um, in those rates as the city reaches. Um, so we are looking, just so everybody's clear, this particular discussion completely and only serves our sewer. There has been a lot of Facebook scuttlebutt and a lot of other things about we're raising everything. We are not raising everything. We are raising one component of your utility bill from the city and that is the base rate for the sewer. <coughs> that is the only thing that we're asking council to look at tonight and in the future. Okay, We will talk water a completely different time but this discussion is strictly for sewer. Um, there was one as far as what the rate structure and currently there is no difference between residential rates and commercial rates. We could implement a different rate structure if council so desires. Um, the different rates throughout the valley in Colorado will also be shown. Um, I'll talk about those here in a second. Um, just so everybody's clear, base rates are usually used to pay any and all debt service. In order to meet those debt demands, you need to have a consistent income level coming in. No different than what most folks do for their, their own budgets to pay for their car payments or their insurance. You try to make sure you have a consistent amount of funds to cover those necessities. Um, So I'm just gonna I'll take a break at this point and just kind of go over some of the water rates. So Colorado median monthly household water and sewer bills, according to the census, thank you, Anita, for getting me this data. Um, she's been really helpful with me on this. Um, 2016, the average median Colorado monthly sewer bill, well, this is just base rates, was $30.05. 2017, it's $30.59. 2018, $33.44. 2019, $34.37. Our current rates are $18.39. We are proposing an initial one this year to be $31. So that will get us right at the midline for the things to get it a little more closer um, Alamosa's 2021 sewer rate was $35 Glenwood Springs a little bit bigger community um, they have $120 a month sewer bill Golden has 35 Idaho Springs has 61 Los Animas has 37 Lyons has 65 Mancus a community much smaller than we are has 42, Platteville has 66, and Rifle has 84. So we are not proposing anything that's absolutely outrageous in the grand scheme. As we did in our first meeting, we tried to express to everybody, this is not a Monta Vista issue. This is a state and a national issue um, of an aging infrastructure, more stringent requirements to protect our watersheds and our water qualities. Um, that we, as good stewards for water, we have to meet. So, um, Nick, with that, did you have anything you might want to add on that one? Yeah, yeah. I just, just to you know, discuss, to discuss rates and comparisons of rates. It's important to keep in mind. Robert had mentioned, you know, community size um, comparisons between community size. Um, it's also important to note that many communities. It, it, both small, very small, and larger are going through their own projects, just like Rob mentioned. It's not 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 a Monta Vista issue. Um, you know, the new new regulations are coming and, and impacting many many communities. Um, so typically, rates are inversely proportional to communities size. So a very large community, let's take an extreme example, is uh, you know, the city and county of Denver. Uh, the, the population 
population density uh, is, is so large, and they have so many users to pay the bills, their, their, their bills can be lower. Um, so when I say uh, it's inversely proportional, typically a smaller community will have higher uh, water and sewer bills because they have less, less taps, less customers to pay for those, those improvements that are required. Also, an important thing to consider is where, where our community is immediately through the regions. Some have not been impacted yet. Others already have. So where you hear about those higher rates, you know, Idaho Springs, they just did a um, pretty significant uh, upgrade to the wastewater treatment plant and had to support that with higher rates. Other communities uh, that you can compare nearby, um, such as, you know, Del Norte, they have the, 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 the large uh, collection system project, but it's possible that they'll have a, a wastewater project, treatment plant project come up. So, um, you know, you, 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 there's a lot of nuance in those numbers, but I just, uh, that, that's kind of what I wanted to throw out there. It just can keep that in mind. And then the last question that was asked was annexation, especially Sherman. Um, people are looking to see if the city's has plans to annex. Um, currently, the city has no concrete plans to annex any more area. We are looking at creating slash updating our three mile plans um, because unless we have that updated, we actually legally cannot actually can do an annexation. So that is the first step. And then we will look at annexation. But um, there was also some concern that the city was going to do the heavy handed thing and start trying to force annexations. And I can assure you, and I stand here with council that at this time, council is not looking at any force of annexations. All annexations would be on a volunteer basis and it would be reviewed by council before anything would happen. So um, I guess at that point, sir, open it up for public. Well, let me just ask a couple of general questions, maybe a rock for people that might have an interest. Where would the plant be located, and would there be a need for additional employees to man the plant, if you will? Right now, we're looking at the area um, would be southeast of where the current lagoon system is, so directly off of East Drive. In the area, we have a flat field out there that's looking where we're looking at trying to construct that plant. Um, it gives us the closest proximity to the existing <coughs> headworks so we can keep the piping and, and that cost fairly low, at least to get it to the effluent or the <coughs> influent to the plant. Um, there are some other components of that project which would be bring in, instead of us operating two plants, trying to consolidate those into one. So, and that would be through enforcement. Do any members of the public have any questions directly for uh, Rob here? Is the, is the size of the plant you're considering now, does that take into consideration the growth of the community? Yes, CDPHE requires us to have a certain component of growth in there. Um, <clears throat> we will probably, Nick, maybe address that, but definitely probably, you don't want to size them too small so you do have to increase but at the same token you don't want to have them so large that they just simply don't perform the way they're supposed to so you've tried to right we, we want to be able to have what our plan is to accommodate a, a, a reasonable amount of future growth based on um, the historic population growth of, of Monta Vista we've also built in you know Sometimes in the rural communities, the population growth can be pretty sporadic. So we built, built in a little bit what we exactly what brought, we don't want to overbuild the plant and, and, and essentially fund that development um, with you know free plant capacity. But we do uh, build in 30, you know, 30 to 40 percent, I would say around 30 percent um, or, or a little more um, capacity with there, not to get too much into the weeds, but there are. Um, there are a couple of permit limits that uh, CPHG uh, builds into each uh, district fresh permit. There's 80% limit. Um, once you get to 80% of the flow, uh, you're required to, uh, to start studying or looking at expansion. And at 95, you're supposed to start constructing that expansion. And so we don't want to be within that, those, those triggers. So we're planning to build a plan. 
plan <coughs> that, that excess capacity. Um, but we do want to balance that with future development having to pay their way as well. So yeah, we're looking at developing a plant at somewhere around 50% capacity. So we're able to utilize the flows that are coming in now, but there's still some room for growth. So, um, Rob, how, how, how much is it going to cost for the total plant as we anticipate now, and how much do you think we're going to get in the way of grants? So, um, to answer that, the project is several components, and the com total project cost is estimated to be right around $30 million. That includes the decommissioning of the two plants we have, a force main from veterans back to the Henderson plant, and then the construction of a brand new plant. Um, and a large portion of that estimated cost is the biosolids removal from the lagoon system at Henderson and also the system there at veterans. So that is a very large component. Um, Nick, I'll let you address what we're talking about as far as what we've budgeted and where that $30 million came from. We, we tried to do it very conservative. We want to make sure that we surprise our residents with good news and not bad news. So I'll let Nick kind of discuss that a little bit. Yeah, so we, we budgeted the, the total project cost at approximately $30 million. I can go into specific details, if you like, about each component. Um, of that. Uh, that does include uh, engineering, um, legal, so these, the soft costs, uh, what we call them, the, the hard costs of construction. As Rob mentioned, there's significant money put aside or budgeted for um, uh, the uh, decommissioning of the, the two existing facilities, biosolids removal, um, and then the, the listation of force main from uh, veterans to Henderson and the new treatment plant. Um, we, we don't know at this time what the portion of grant versus loan will be. Uh, we have an application, a funding application into USDA um, Rural Development. Uh, that, and and uh, once, the, once they've completed their underwriting um, for the project, they will present what's called a letter of conditions, um, which is basically the funding package they are offering, and it will, uh, it will include a uh, grant amount and a uh, loan amount. Um, it'll be a loan, loan it, that loan amount will be whatever it is, will be a low interest loan, um, and, and the term can be up to 40 years. The issuance of that letter of conditions, that funding package, doesn't mean you're committed to do the project. It, it is essentially USDA saying, okay, you submitted all of you, these documents we required, the preliminary engineering report, the environmental report, the funding application, all of that stuff, you submitted that, that's approved. Here's our offer to fund the project. They will, they, they will fund the whole project. Um, it's just what the question is that, that, that was asked is what is the grant and what is the loan? We, we don't know that yet, but if we've assumed 40% grant, 60% loan. Um, we've seen much better than that. We've seen the high of the high end at 75% grant. Um, and I have seen um, on the low end 30 to 35 percent. I don't expect you to be on the low end, but I also would not plan on or you know uh, set your expectations to be on the you know on the high end. So sorry, so the low end. I'm sorry, but I wouldn't set your expectations to to, to be at the, at the highest of the high. The max they'll give is that 75 percent. I've only seen it once. Um, but once that letter of conditions is is submitted to the city, we'll, we'll be back here again to discuss it and present to you that, that offer, that package. All right, any other further questions? And then we may let folks make comments if you so desire. Okay, um, thank you, Rob. Uh, does anyone wish to make comments or I do. Yeah. You want uh, to go on up there, go oh, okay. on and okay. state your name for the record and then <clears throat> sign in. And if you could sign your name as well, please. Certainly. I'll step out of the way. Okay. 
Uh, my name is Lauren Buss. I am not a city resident, I'm a county resident, but I'm here on behalf of two downtown businesses, one home, and the Presbyterian Church, just so we understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I realize there's a lot of information that has not been received yet, and this may just be uh, asking for down the road information to get. One question I have is, or a comment first is, my, it's my general understanding that heavy metals do not come from, directly from residential home, you know, residential use. These are probably more industry or business related. Has there been an identification of, I'm going to say point source or a general uh, feeling of where these metals might be coming from that could be uh, traced to and not to penalize anyone, but are there uh, systems that could be put in place to help those facilities so that it does in, in the long run helps the city of Monta Vista. I don't know if that information is available yet or if that's down the road you know to try and take care of but it, I, I feel that that could be a component and then if there are some businesses or an industry that is I'll say a heavy uh, contributor to this is there some way that uh, equipment can be gotten a system to put in place for those businesses to help stop the problem at the point of their uh, business rather than it going into the city system. Just a uh, little general question there and um, I, I understand and I appreciate that council has a real task set out for you and one of the questions I think you answered a little bit Rob is how far down the line is this system going to be effective for given the growth you know are we looking at a projection of maybe 20 percent population increase within the city so this system can easily absorb that if it now I've only been in the town area here for about 50 years and the town has stayed between four and five thousand people but we know that uh, populations can increase for given reasons and it's just part of the prudent planning and I, I would imagine from what we've heard tonight that uh, that is being taken into consideration just wondering to what degree but, uh, you know, I guess we're all money conscious these days and we appreciate what you're doing on the, uh, the, the grants and the funding. But I'm just wondering too, if there isn't some way that maybe individual businesses maybe that are the, I'll say the more heavily associated contributors with this might be able to get a little relief and in, in effect help the city also for all the residents of the town. Do you have any questions for me? If not, that's pretty much my piece. So, Nick, maybe if you can hear me, can you go yeah. ahead and address, well, I'll just kind of do each one of those separately. So first, address where does the heavy metals, the metals come from within our system? Um, just kind of touch on that briefly. Yes, yeah, so, so the, and, and I really appreciate the question. It's, it's a really good question. Um, the, uh, and, and this is that that question, you know, and, and making sure that that people that industries or businesses that may contribute something, you know, something like this are are not impacting the greater uh, residential uh, rates is, is really important to watch for. Unfortunately, much of the the, the metals that we are treating for come from, you know, in it come from infill flow and infiltration from um, groundwater into the collection system. And we, uh, we have gone through uh, a, a four or five year long program uh, and uh, many millions of dollars spent to reduce that inflow and infiltration as much as possible. This project actually includes a little more of that. Um, but we did see significant metal, metal, hit the, the metal decreases with that project, but not in sufficient amounts to meet the CDPHE F4 limits. Um, those limits are specific for the stream segment, the stream, the river segments on the Rio Grande where you discharge. So, so it, it is. A, it's a good question, and, and that is the direction we, we would go um, if we had, you know, an industrial user that was contributing contributing these. Um, and then the, the other question, obviously, was that, you know, like. A, the same thing, a good question. We are planning for a reasonable amount of growth. Again, we have to walk that fine line between not looking uh, at and, and uh, planning for uh, and 
funding uh, development. Uh, yeah, because development should pay its own way, but uh, but not building a plant that's going to have to be expanded in the next um, ten to twenty years. So that that is our goal to have a facility that does not need to be expanded because of growth within the twenty year time frame. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, comments? Thank you, Lauren. <coughs> All right, uh, seeing none, I guess uh, we would go ahead and close the public hearing at this point. Okay, back in session. Okay, council, um, like I said, I don't need a decision as far as the rate increase. I do have a few questions that are in your packet <laughs> that I would like some direction from council. Um, does council at this time even want to address raising the rates this year we had originally talked about bringing to you a rate increase proposal for your first meeting in may for your approval for the second meeting in may um, so i just want to know if that's still with the way you want us to go with that the idea would be able to do it through resolution the rate increase in the second meeting in may and that would enable those rate increases to go into effect on the June billing. And that would cover the period from May 15th, or 16th, excuse me, May 16th to June 15th. We, we might actually have to move that back uh, two weeks just because we're only having one council meeting in May. Oh, that is correct. So Unless we need to reschedule, have a special meeting to address this. Yeah, we can do that too. Yeah. And I think, I, I don't think necessarily, just so council's aware, I don't think we need to have a special meeting unless you really want to target that June target. We can initiate it in July as well, and it still kind of meets the idea where we're only missing a month. So it's not, so at this point, it's not critical. I would think we still stay on task. I mean, we kicked the can down the road this far. Let's just stay on task. So. Okay. I'm one of us, sir, so you guys pipe in, but I think I we need to just stay on top of yeah. that, move mm -hmm. along, so we can move it to the, come in the second meeting, of, or the last of May, and then, and then uh, full first, formally adopted first meeting in June, yep, with then, implementation for July. Yes. And that's six months for a calendar year, so that would, that would fit very nicely. Okay, um, next question is, would council want us to look at different rate structures versus resident versus commercial business? Um, Nick, real quick, while we still have you, um, there are no significant industrial users on our system right now other than proximity malt, and they are a completely separate entity that's really not contributing to what people assume is the heavy metals it's not really for us it's not an industrial user that's contributing to that is that a true statement yeah yeah and they have their own um separate discharge permit to the um, veterans facility so not a not a cdpg discharge permit but a city issued permit for discharge facility okay and we don't have any other main industrial users on our system? No. There are no other major industrial users. Okay. So um, does council want to entertain the idea of having a separate commercial rate from a residential rate? We don't have that on our water system. We don't have it on our sewer system at this point. What do other... It, it's... Mm -hmm. Councilor, it's really varied. Some do. Some have separate rates. Um, I guess my concern with that is that it can seem, and I'm going to just please understand that as an opinion, seem unfriendly to business where if you're going to in charge commercial businesses more, it could be taken that we're not business friendly versus if we were to charge them a lower rate then we're not providing a good service to the bulk of our residents. 
So by the rate structure that we have now, it's pretty much an even keel. Everybody's sharing in the same, for lack of a better term, the same pain. So, so completely up to council. I mean, we can definitely bring a couple of things back. That's kind of what I wanted to do with this meeting. We just kind of get a sense of where you would like us to. If you would like to see what some variations of different rate structures at the next meeting, we could definitely do that for you. Do we have any data to back that up? I mean, do we know that a commercial user is X amount over? Then that'd be purely conjecture, we'd just be guessing. At this point, it would be purely conjecture and we would be using data and rates based off of what other communities do. I can't say that their users would be very similar to ours. I guess for me at this Nick, point. Did you have a question or comment on that? I, I just say that, that com commercial use can vary pretty widely among, you know, al along the lines of what's considered commercial. So you could have a, you know, a gas station that's heavily utilized that has a lot of people there using the bathrooms, contributes quite a bit of waste water, or you could have a small, you know, uh, uh, realtor office that has three people that work in it, or, or, you know, that would contribute much less to the single family. Um, residential unit, um, you uh, you know you do capture some of that in your um, in your usage. There is there is a, a usage fee um, for wastewater based off of winter water use. Um, so you will capture some of that um, in uh, in the commercial water use um, if it's if it's a, a very busy commercial entity that uses a lot of water in the winter. They'll pay a little larger sewer bill. Um, so you, you capture a little bit of, that, of it, but there's not a clear delineation between, you know, between commercial, industrial, or uh, commercial and residential and base rate. I guess my take would be at this point we keep it the same for both, and if we have a big change in our industrial entities, then we can come back and address that then, <coughs> or on an individual basis, like we dealt with proximity mall. Just come as a because you prepared that already for us once. Okay. And then the last question I have for you is um, do we want to propose at the next meeting an annual increase, even though we don't know exactly what? Um, the USDA offer is going to be at this time, or would you prefer us just to do the rate increase and then once we know the offer, bring you back something so everybody knows what that total figure is? I guess I'd rather everyone know up front we're going to increase it this way, step to step. If we get to come back and tell them it's going to be less, that'd be great, but better to have people prepared ahead of time versus. You know, because we start that and if it comes backwards of what we want to do, then we have to go up a little bit more sooner. We just take the steps. I agree with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then I'm open for any questions. Those are all the questions I have. I don't know if staff, GG, council has anything else. Public? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Nick, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for uh, inviting me to your meeting tonight. Thanks, Nick. Nick has COVID, so we hope he gets better. Oh. <clears throat> Can't tell he has COVID. <clears throat> okay, we will move on to resolution 2022-5. Resolution declaring a disaster. Make a motion to approve Resolution 2022-5, declaring a disaster in the city of Monte Vista. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Do I need to read this out before we? I, I think I yes. would. Okay. Uh, and similar resolution was passed this morning by the Rio Grande County Commissioners. Okay, <clears throat> and then we'll vote on it. 
Resolution 2022-5, City of <clears throat> Monta Vista Disaster Declaration Declaring a Local Disaster. Whereas the City of Monta Vista Police Chief has advised the Monta Vista City Council of a disaster. <clears throat> As that term is defined in Monta Vista Municipal Code, Article 7, Section 2-7-20, currently present in the area of the city of Monta Vista and whereas the risk of wildfire threaten the citizens and visitors of Monta Vista and whereas the cost and magnitude of responding to and recovery from the impact of this event is far in excess of the city's available resources and all available resources are being utilized or have been expended and whereas an imminent threat exists to the Monta Vista community within Rio Grande County and whereas approximately 15 or more structures could be impacted and whereas the Monta Vista Police Chief has recommended that City Council declare a local disaster and whereas it would be appropriate and in the interest of the public health and safety and would further protect property for City Council to implement said recommendations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Council hereby declares that there is a local disaster in the area of Rio Grande County within the city limits of Monta Vista, to wit, the occurrence or imminent threat of widespread or severe damage property resulting from the fire. The effect of this declaration of disaster shall be <clears throat> to activate the response and recovery aspects of any and all applicable applicable local and in juris inner jurisdictional disaster emergency plans and to authorize the furnishing of aid and assistance under such plans <clears throat> be it further resolved that the principal executive officers of all other municipalities in Monta Vista affected mm -hmm. by said mm -hmm. disaster are proclaiming similar declarations and to cooperate with Rio Grande County is necessary to cope with this incident. <clears throat> be it further resolved that this resolution shall be effective upon the date given below and shall remain in effect for a period of not to exceed seven days thereafter, except by or with the consent of a majority of the members of City Council. True copies will be filed promptly with the Colorado Office of Emergency Management and the Rio Grande County Clerk and Recorder and shall be promptly distributed to the appropriate representatives of the news media. Dated this 21st day of April, 2022. Is there any more discussion? Anita? Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Oh, sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Segola. Aye. Mayor Becker. Aye. This motion carries to approve resolution 2022 5 declaring a disaster. Gigi, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I'll, we can talk a little bit about it when, when I give my report. Okay, very good. Contracts, agreements, and leases, purchase of landlocked property located at Lot 14, Block 12, Kerr and the Master Edition. Thank you, Council. Um, so we had a situation where a landowner came to us. They had purchased a piece of property off Harrison Street that they bought a property off at a tax sale. Mm -hmm. And they did not come down and look at it prior. And they were totally landlocked. And by law, it's our responsibility to mm -hmm. make sure mm -hmm. that people have access to the property. So we had a couple of options. One was to um, get an easement from the vacant land that was to the west of it, and we'd have to build a dirt road so that they would have their own private access. Or we could start dismantling mm -hmm. an alleyway where people have built fences and 
um, kind of overtaken the alley that has gone on for 20 some years. So Rob and I made the executive, and with consultation with, with Mike, we approached the gentleman and said, the city is interested and we'll just buy, you, buy the property for what you paid for it. And so the cost that he incurred was almost $1,200, so I rounded it up to $1,200, and he accepted the offer. And so I'm asking for you all to approve the deed that this gentleman has signed requesting payment from the city of Monta Vista for $1,200 for a lot that we will now own, and hopefully one of the other the owners on either side of that property will purchase it back then from the city. If they don't purchase it, then we'll probably get pretty aggressive in, in uh, our code enforcement because right now, from what we can, what we're making assumptions, but one of the other neighbors has already encroached on that property and using it as if it is theirs anyway. It's a very small lot. Um, the man has said that he has since, because of this, he's, he's been highly complimentary of how this has all been handled. Greatly appreciates, you know, all the consideration and working with him. And he said he's already acquired another piece of property in Monta Vista that they will be working on to improve. Do we have any issues of adverse possession if the neighbor has already encroached upon it? Well, mostly it's the alley. Structures have been built over okay. the alley over many, many years. You cannot gain adverse possession against the government or the city. Now, if against an individual, you may have some issues there, but most of the problem has been the alleyway. For us to open it up and try and get rid of structures, I don't know how much cost that would be in litigation. And for all practical purposes, other than this one piece of property, it's we, we might in the long run end up just vacating that alley because it's only being used by very few people. And so I think the cost of getting the problem resolved at 1200 is probably pretty minimal. And my guess is one of those folks is going to want to buy it that's the neighbor anyway. So I think it solves a, at least an immediate problem versus the cost of litigation and trying to open up that alley and remove structures and buildings. It's kind of a mess. So. Or obtaining an easement and building a road. And right. That cost us a lot of money too. I, I think for right now, that's the cheapest and most economical way to go here. Where is this at again? <clears throat> it's on Harrison Street. Do you remember the house number, Rob? I did real quick. I don't remember it often. So it's in Lariat. Jesse Chacon owns, I think, oh, most okay. of that property back there. Okay. And it's just cars and buildings and everything on it. So. Right on that corner? Yeah. It's actually the middle of the block. It's just above what used to be the old right of way of the street that was vacated years and years ago. So the property directly south of that was street right of way. That was vacated. So the alley comes up. Um, the city vacated officially and legally what used to be the street right of way for a street that was platted originally never built between the two roads so there's a you, you don't have a through alley anyways um, so you have that piece there and then everybody to the north and Harrison is the street that comes in and has that weird dog leg and then drops down to um, Ray Street so there's no good way to access it and everybody north has already built across and south, due to that vacation of the street right away, there is no access from the south to the property. So, so it's kind of, kind of in a pickle. And I, if we need the address, I can pull it. You okay? Yeah. <clears throat> We're okay. 
and we would I would uh, is it just an emotion mm-hmm. so I would uh, motion to prove that the city um, <clears throat> purchased the land from uh, what would he be called uh, David and Janice Thornberry. So from uh, David and Janice Thornberry. On lot 14, block 12, Kerr and Lee Master Edition. Um, for the property located at lot 14, block 12, Kerr and Lee Master Edition. Second. It's been moved and seconded <clears throat> to. Uh, the purchase of landlocked property located at lot 14, block 12, Kern Lamaster edition from David and Janice Thornberry. Is there any more discussion? You need a Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to purchase the land. As stated. Thank you. Thank you. Staff proposals, reports, and actions. City clerk. <coughs> no, she's not. I always highlight that one for me so then I know. And she like ditched the uh, see she's hiding it there, so forget. <laughs> I always forget her, so Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Just a few things this evening. Uh, First of all, there was a question about the charter review and update. I just wanted to kind of go over the process of the charter review. So um, planning and zoning and staff and the city attorney can review the charter and make suggested changes to the charter. Those changes have to be sent out to the vote of the people. The charter can't just be changed like with an ordinance or resolution, it has to be changed by the vote of the people. So when we do do the charter update, we need to make sure that we are doing it in completion so that the cost to the city and the cost to the voters is minimal. And it's maybe a one or two time thing that we would take it to the voters. Um, So I just wanted to give you the process on that. Um, The other thing is the Planning and Zoning Commission is now fully staffed. We will be having our first meeting on the 28th of this month. Um, Just going to go over some basic things and then some of the things that we're going to start giving them to look at is the three mile plan and the annexation plan. So that is pretty much all I have for you guys. Um, I just wanted to say Um, It's amazing to see how our community, neighboring communities, and even other cities in Colorado have reached out and have come together to support (coughs) all of those who have been affected by the fire. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Thank you, Anita. Any questions? Thank you. Public Works. Let's get tired of seeing me. been a long week for everybody so I'll try to keep my report pretty short so you have my written report um, I'm just gonna kind of hit the tops and then if you have any questions I'll go through so Arbor Day has been scheduled this year for May 12th at 1 o'clock at the Montez Skate Park um, mr. mayor if you could either plan or if the city manager Gigi would want to give a little speech on that that would be fantastic um, we are moving it actual arbor day is the 29th of april but due to our weather and how cold it is it's really not conducive to planting trees so we moved it so we have a little warmer weather so um i don't know if Gigi was planning on talking about but just briefly on the sep we are working still with cdphe on that um i'll let her kind of brief some of the things that happened this week um and then mosquito spraying this is more for the citizens um, we sent out letters to those people that have last year were on our do not spray list. Um, we are asking for a very short application, so we have written documentation. So you should have received those in the mail. If you do not wish to be sprayed, you need to get with the city and myself specifically and get a form and get it filled out and returned to us. 
Um, we are trying to do some education. We had some problems last year with people interfering with the operations and we'd like to make sure that we, that doesn't happen in the future. Um, we know everybody has different feelings on, on the mosquito spray and our techniques. So we just want to do it as an educational thing. That's the only thing the form is used for so we can keep a record and then we can kind of talk to you and educate you about what our processes are and how we actually go about spraying from an operational standpoint. Um, events this coming up, uh, May 5th is going to be Cinco de Mayo, big celebration again. Um, the high school has approached us about hanging banners for the graduating class again, so unless council has any issue, I've fully planned to support that. I think it's been really good the last couple of years, so I think it's neat to see the young folks hanging up on the streets and, and taking, you know, getting their, their, their moment in the sun, so to speak. Um, so if you haven't noticed, CDOT is in town. They're currently doing a project. They are replacing, at least on the east side of town, um, the ADA ramps. So 160 will have several lane closures where the highway will be reduced to single lane with the fire and everything going on. I have asked them not to close the highway for the remainder of the week. They will resume operations beginning Monday. And here in the very near future, I do believe not this next week, but the week after, they will close 160 in its entirety right there at the Alta area so they can replace those railroad tracks. So detours will be set up, but you will not be able to access 160 eastbound or westbound for about three days um, when that goes into effect. I will try to work with CDOT and we'll make sure that we get it out on our Facebook page and our website when that closure is coming. So just be aware that it is coming and it should happen, not this coming week, but the week after. And with that, I'll open it up for your questions, Council Member. Um, just you. got a question. Yes. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe. <coughs> uh, when was uh, last year? When did we start our water restrictions? Last year we started those in June. In June. I think it was June. Yeah, I need to talk to you guys about that. And I, we also need to probably talk about city cleanup days um, with everything that's going on. Um, maybe hold off on that for a different time frame to talk about those perfect but yeah we don't we we usually start those two okay. <clears throat> people actually start turning their people are with as dry as it is people are starting to turn their systems on now but i think in june we need to really have that conversation about water conservation awesome thank you thank you Christian. good to see you so, as always, don't have a whole lot to report tonight. We've just more been continuing to strengthen our network security. We have recently completed an audit of every single user in compar user on our network in comparison to employees here. A lot of old accounts that needed to be deactivated. This is more just sins of the past coming back, having to go through and clean them up. That being said, we are wrapping up most of our projects in the network security section of IT. And other than that, it's been a lot of little things. DOS is now here full time, so I know everyone's been either enjoying having him around or quite the opposite. I personally <laughs> hope it's the opposite. That being said, he's been taking care of everything fairly well, and I don't have much else to report from it. Then I hope I beat my uh, record on reports. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, now's the time. You're close. You're close. Yeah, I think it's a it's a tough bar to get over. That's for sure. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. City manager report. <coughs> Thank you again. I've got lots of this and that to talk about, but um, I want to open up with, with talking about what's taken place in the last 36 hours or so. We've had tremendous outreach, as you, you all know, from our fire department, our police department, our public works, other city staff, um, contractors from around the valley, 
food from around the valley as people have responded with such big hearts and, and great concern over the fire. And it has been very uplifting, you know, when it, it's a shame that you have to see the true love of a community when an incident like this happens. And um, it's been, it's been overwhelming. It's been really, really very thoughtful and caring people wanting to reach out and help in any way to do anything. Today, what, what took place, uh, we continued, the chief continued to have meetings with everybody. Um, we had, we met early this morning with the fire department and got a debriefing. And they had two minor flare-ups last night that they were able to get extinguished as they were looking for hot spots. After, after the public presentation and, and our report last night, the police and fire department called up each family individually by address, informed them then on a little bit more personal basis of your home is standing or, or your home is gone. And so that, that went on for quite a while. Uh, it, it, after the inventory today, there were 15 structures that were burned. Eight of those 15 were homes. Two of those homes were unoccupied. So we have six families truly displaced. So then today, uh, mid-morning, we quickly called together some of our community partners. We had the Nazarene Church, since they were offered uh, were the emergency shelter. We had um, the Nazarene Thrift Store. We had the Food Bank. We had um, the Department of Local Affairs. We had the Department of, of Human Services from Rio Grande County. I'm trying to look around, think about the names around the table. And, and anyway, oh, and then the Monta Vista Community fund to talk about what do we do next and how do we, where do we direct resources that people may need. And so this evening from four to six, we put out the word that we had a variety of different agencies. We had DOLA again, we had San Luis Valley Housing, we had the Boys and Girls Club, we had the Nazarene Thrift Store, we had the Food Bank, we had the city, and I'm not even sure who else were there representing so that these families could come in and they kind of went from table to table to find out what they needed. Department of Local Affairs set them all up with an ID card because there are some businesses <clears throat> who have said, if they come in and can tell me that they were in the fire, we'll give them X. And so this will be a little bit of proof of, of of showing of what they're doing. And um, the, Anita was there and we had uh, Rob, had Bob, we had Bob Abeta there and then the chief. Our role is, is that we are talking about what the city wants to do and what we're taking a, a more proactive approach and thinking that you all are going to, going to agree that we will be responsible for the cleanup. When you look at the resources of these folks, I think it's gonna be a little challenging for them to go through the asbestos abatement, getting a contractor to come in and clean up, and then making sure that it is properly disposed of in the landfill. We don't know yet what the cost of that is gonna be, it'll be expensive. Just that whole uh, asbestos abatement is a big deal. But then we can get the community cleaned up on in one swoop. Um, it'll clear the way if some of those folks want to rebuild and it won't sit there for months um, mm -hmm. causing a hazard to the community. Rob mentioned the SIP, and I only tie that into this because CDPHE has outreached to us and saying, is there something with the fire 
that maybe we can offset the sip um, with it. That just came in about 520, so I haven't had time to, to visit with Rob about that to see if we can't pull something together because they want to approve whatever we suggest. Um, let's see, so I think that's it. We don't have any of our street crew out there any longer. Um, the streets are back open. People can get back into their homes, come and go. There's no more blocking enclosures in that area of town. For the, is the <clears throat> last night there was a evacuated section. All those people are available going back to their homes. Yes. And last night they, you know, there was um, some pushback at the press conference. Some folks highly emotional as it would be for any of us. And um, about 8 o'clock, it was announced that if their home appeared to be safe and it was cleared by the fire department, we let those folks go back home last night. So we didn't actually have anybody that was in the emergency shelter overnight. Um, others found family to go to or friends. and. And I want to thank all of you for being there. Um, this has been a bit, been a tough week for the city. I, I've, I don't want to promise I'm not going to go on vacation again. <laughs> Last week I had a wonderful vacation and I came back to a very full week of, you guys have been working hard every, every night. Um, I had a question for, for you all. We've never really talked much about CML and their legislative agenda. And if Monta Vista takes, wants to take stands in support of what their, their um, pros and cons are on, on various bills. The other day they, they sent out a notice and it was House Bill 1362 and they asked for us to reach out to our legislators and so I, I did. I figured this was one that you guys would have supported or you, were, you would support to oppose which was CML standing. And what this bill does is they want um, to mandate that we create and enforce an energy code and we lower our carbon emissions. And I'm not saying that that's not a bad, bad idea I'm saying that I don't, I'm saying that I hope you all believe that we shouldn't be supporting unfunded mandates in that fashion. Uh, I contacted Representative Vigil, or Valdez, excuse me, and um, Representative Valdez said he was trying to work with the, the sponsor to not make it a mandate, but make it a, if you'd like to, you can do this sort of thing. So I just kind of wanted a, a little bit of a thumbs up or thumbs down from you all. Do you want me to engage in some of these when they say call? Are you guys calling them? Um, do you care? <laughs> you know, a lot of the things CML does, they're fighting for or fighting against is because it does impact municipalities in one way or another. Yes, unfunded mandates I'm, I'm against as well. I appreciate it when you look at it because you've dealt with a lot of that in the past. And you're uh, very knowledgeable on it. So I trust your judgment when you bring something to us. It's because you've researched it and looked at it. So okay. thank you. Okay. So in saying that, the CML summer training is coming up June 22nd, I believe. Council Member Sagala has already signed up, but if any one of the three of you can squeeze in a day or two, it's in Breckenridge, I think you'll find it highly beneficial. Just the topics, the networking with your other colleagues. Uh, we have somebody on the executive board from the San Luis Valley, and that is Liz. Thompson Hensley out of Alamosa on Alamosa City Council. So just 
look at your calendars again and, and it's budgeted for you all to attend and, and Nita will be happy to get your um, reservations made if you'd like. What's the dates on that? I believe it's June 22nd, 3rd and 4th. <coughs> what days of the week are those? Um, 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 Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's what I'm thinking. They, again, I'm making an assumption that they probably start around noon or shortly after noon on that Tuesday, go all day Wednesday, and break noon or early afternoon on Thursday. So they allow for dry top drive time. Um, let's see, what else? The mayor and Rob and I met with the Rio Grande County Weed District. You know, by state statute, we are mandated <laughs> to take care of our weeds and our right of ways. They've given us a proposal for us to, for them, for Rio Grande County to manage that. One of their first areas they were, they were looking at targeting was around Sky High Park and trying to get rid of all of the, I don't know the fancy name for it, I call them goat heads. Puncture vine. Puncture vine. Puncture vine. It's kind of costly, and Rob and I haven't had a chance to kind of sit down and, and with Anita as well to just kind of review our budget and see, okay, if we can't do everything that they want, can we at least start? Can we just piece this out a little bit and, and then budget more for it for next year? So in the next meeting or so, we'll be talking, coming back to talk more about noxious weeds on city property. Yesterday started out really great. We had several employees uh, that came to participate in our Earth Day trash pickup. Thank you, Councilwoman Locke, for joining us. It, you know, it's, it's kind of weird how yesterday blew up and was turned out to be such a terrible day because yesterday morning at 8 o'clock, it was beautiful. The wind, there wasn't any wind. It was warm enough you could pick up trash without a jacket. And, um, we got it done in an hour, and I didn't ask Rob how many bags of trash we gathered up. <coughs> we did, we did good. So it was, I think it was a worthwhile project. And San Luis Valley Federal Bank and Linda Burnett from the Chamber also joined us. So it was nice to get some outside help. Monday night, you guys went through Planning 101 with the new Planning and Zoning Commission. Good, bad, good time. I liked it. Yeah, Very good. Good um, yeah. use of time. Wonderful. So we'll be joining, getting them back on, on track. And then let's see, Tuesday night we had this sky high discussion regarding recreation or um, event center. I think that's going to probably take a little bit more discussion. Stephanie, our event center manager, showed me kind of her whole year calendar right now. <coughs> We've got a lot of events, and so we are going to have to really be thoughtful in trying to manage both that recreational aspect as well as with people that want to use it for events and um, come up with We'll just continue to work on a plan to bring to you guys and see what we can do to make it make it work for for everyone and and everyone's gonna be a little bit hurt, but we'll see what we can do to spread the love, I guess. We have hired a new HR director. Her name is Judy Phillips. She had been working down at Adams State and she joins us on Monday. Bob Gill is, his kind of unofficial ending date will be May the 5th, but then he'll be coming the next, I believe, four consecutive Mondays to make sure that still the training and transition goes through so we've got her feeling good about taking over and, and what we've got going. Right now we have, um, uh, the only openings 
we have right now would be our is in <coughs> public works and so we've had a couple resignations in that area and so I think Rob continues to struggle keeping a full workforce especially now as we're going into a busy summer season we're fully staffed with the police department and we've made offers today for our seasonal help in the rec department so hopefully we'll be rocking and rolling again questions thank you okay thank, thank you thank you for all yesterday too <coughs> that's right <laughs> Council, council committee, city, yes, I don't, council committee, city commission, and council reports. Jason, we'll start with you. Uh, just the same as everyone. Thanks to the police and the fire department and all the other <coughs> police and fire departments that showed up, paramedics and everyone who helped out. Uh, it was a horrible day, but it could have been so much worse, and it was handled, I think, as well as could be. Victor? Um, I just want to reiterate that. You know, it's <clears throat> devastating. The fire is no joke. You know, and <clears throat> just to see, you know, the, you know, the collaboration between all of these agencies come together. This is pretty awesome. You know, like at the press conference, you know, there were people upset with their burned homes. So I, I totally get it, you know. But it was kind of like they were blaming the fire department for it kind of in a sense you know and i'm like man you know like fire has got its own thing you know like you can't control it um <clears throat> so just want to extend my prayers and my thoughts to all those families out there um and then one one thing um i did kind of get approached on uh is uh the the parking lot of the polished bean um there's <clears throat> There, there's a, from what I, what they've told me, there's constantly cars parked along the ditch, along the road, because there's nowhere to park um, at the Polished Bean, because they have like, I don't know, all these granite slabs in their parking lot. That's just kind of taking over their whole parking lot. So like, you know, their drive-through <clears throat> is, I don't know, I think it's a safety hazard, honestly. Um, just to see all the cars parked there, people speeding through there. Um, I actually was over there uh, maybe last week or so, and I saw uh, this red truck, this big red truck, and he was just like <laughs> flying through there. You know, and I'm like, that road is like just as big for that truck just by itself, you know? And then uh, I know a lady that works down, or that lives down there, and she goes, and I told her about it, and I, he, she goes, He's doing that all the time, you know? And I'm just like, that's a pretty little dangerous little section right there. You come out of that drive through and there's, you know, people come in this way, there's a fence. I don't know, it's just, I just, I don't know if somebody could look at that. And so but that's what I have. Thank you, Victor. Martha? Well, I, I, I this is a hard one. I too think all of the agencies, all of the firefighters, all everybody that showed up, and if I tried to list them, I'd forget somebody. I want to thank the victims. For many of them, and I didn't realize this when I said, sure, I'll do that, and I was handed the sign-in sheet. I didn't realize that I was going to be the first face that they saw after the last face that they saw telling them, get out. And they're scared. And they walked in there afraid, and they walked in there crushed and confused. And for the most part, every single one of them was kind. And they thanked me that they were the ones, they were the ones that deserved the thanks. 
because they had every right to emotionally just lose it, and they didn't. And they stuck there, and they asked for what they needed, and they told me what they needed, and I directed them to where they could get that help, not that I could give any of it. But what brought it home, mm -hmm. and what I hope brings it home for us, all of us, is I had a young boy that wanted to sit in my lap while I talked to his mom. I'm guessing he was about three. And we were talking, I was talking with his mom, and he looked up at me at one point, I thought he was fine, I, I really did, I thought he was fine, I thought he was just bouncing on my lap and it was fine. And at one point he just stopped and he looked at me and he said, why did God take my house away? So here's where I'm going to thank everyone. Because of everyone that showed up, because of the outpouring of love, because of the donations that were made, I was a thank you. You gave me my answer. I was able to tell him that God didn't take his house away. This horrible fire did. But what God did do was send all of these people and all of this help. And that's what God did. And that's what God was going to continue to do. And then I hope that little boy's question, that we as adults will take it to heart. And I don't want to make a sermon. And I don't know what anybody else's faith is. And I'm not trying to proselytize. But I genuinely believe that our Heavenly Father put his hand on our town yesterday when the winds were predicted to kick up and they didn't. They went down. None of us did that. None of our volunteers did that. None of our agencies did that. God above did that. God above kept all of the people that responded safe. God above got everybody out of their homes in time to keep them from harm. Now, I don't usually go into my faith a lot in here. It's not the place for it. But today it's the place for it. I'm not ashamed to say it. I praise our Heavenly Father for the help that He showed up and He brought everyone else that showed up. And that's all I got. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> that's going to be a tough one to follow. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll back up what everybody here said. <clears throat> Being involved in that yesterday was, you know, I made a statement at a press conference that I didn't sign up for this. I signed up to be the mayor. And I'm proud of that fact because I care about this community. <clears throat> but not what happened yesterday. That tried a lot of people. It brought true colors out of a lot of people. And I will tell you that, uh, respectfully, this is an awesome place to live. And I'm talking the whole San Luis Valley because of the support that came. Um, yesterday, the phones were down. And let me tell you, when this was all going on, I was trying to get a hold of Gigi, I was trying to get a hold of the chief, I was trying to call my kids, my kids were trying to call me, and nothing was working. The only person that I could call was the chief. That's the only person my phone would call. And not him and I were in touch all the time. So when I found out about it, I got right down there, talked to him, and I headed to my office and we started filling water trucks, along with everybody else in this valley. When you got concrete trucks coming from Alamosa full of water, people were here. So um, it was amazing. And with Mr. Duarte, and he's telling us, yeah, there'll be a helicopter here. It'll be the first time that a Forest Service helicopter has ever dropped in town and city limits. And I'm thinking, okay, what's it going to take this chopper to get here? Probably an hour, two hours. He's like, oh, no, it's on its way. It'll be here in about five minutes. And boom, there it was. And that was incredible. 
You know, we had at the conference, there were some upset people, emotions were high. But by the end of that, they weren't so high. They were being thankful. Once they kind of got simmered down and understood what the purpose was. Because it wasn't just their safety, it was all the fire department safety. And I gotta commend the fire department people because the stress that they're under, as I was pumping water into trucks, those guys were just doing their job and they love it. They, they're a different creature by far, but they were taking care of each other, watching out for each other, just like the PD did and everything that they did. So everything that came together, that was uh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> this young man's running around and his cap melts. The brim of these cap melts, that's how far close he was to her. It didn't melt the brim. It shrunk all the padding on the inside of the front of my hat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. I was told that there was a, a lady in a wheelchair that when they went in the door, she came out and they were carrying her out. They were going running, they were running into dangers. Everybody was running away. So, that's off to you guys. <clears throat> I commend this community. I'm proud to be in this seat. So, with that, we will adjourn the meeting till May 19th, 6 p.m right here.